chills. Number 6. Gone in Bulgaria Lars Matank was a 28-year-old German tourist on vacation with his friends in Bulgaria. In 2014, the group was looking for a good time at the Golden Sands, a notoriously inexpensive European party destination. When they arrived, however, Matank found more action than he was asking for. Within one week of partying at the Golden Sands, Matank managed to seriously injure himself after a brawl erupted over a sports team debate. His attackers beat him so badly that doctors suspected that he had ruptured his eardrum, which they feared could develop into a more serious health complication from the changes in air pressure that would occur if he were to fly home. They advised him to wait in Bulgaria for a few more days for his ear to recover. While waiting, Matank supposedly made a call back to his mother in Germany. He said he was being stalked by a group of men and felt in constant danger. Airport security footage shows Matank entering the terminal and visiting the on-site medical clinic for a checkup that would give him the okay to fly home. According to the doctor, Matank appeared calm at first. However, immediately after someone walked into the clinic, the doctor claims Matank suddenly bolted out of the airport in sheer terror. Surveillance footage shows he does not even take his bags with him as he runs as fast as he can out of the parking lot away from the building. Was he truly being followed, or was this a paranoid delusion? Some suspect Matank may have been given strong antibiotics for his ruptured eardrum that made him hallucinate his story of being followed, while others think that the attackers from the Golden Sands were looking for a final showdown. Whatever the case may be, this was over five years ago, so if Matank is still alive, he has yet to step forward from hiding to explain himself. Number 5. The Missing Body of Claudia Lawrence Claudia Lawrence was a 35-year-old chef working at the Goodrick College in the United Kingdom. In March of 2009, she was talking with her mother over the phone as she walked home one afternoon from work. The mother and daughter were very close. It was their second conversation of the day and they were making plans to get together over the weekend for Mothering Sunday, Europe's version of Mother's Day. As Claudia happily spoke with her mother about their upcoming visit, neither one of them could have possibly known that Mothering Sunday would be cut short that year, and that this would be their very last conversation together. In fact, when Claudia ended the cell phone call, it would be the last time anyone would hear her voice again. When Claudia did not show up for work the next day, her colleagues knew something was wrong and contacted the authorities to report her as missing. She was again reported missing by her father, who received a call from nervous friends of Claudia's and went to his daughter's home to investigate. After no one answered, he used a spare key to get into Claudia's home. Everything was in the place, but her cell phone, keys, and her work bag were all missing, which could only mean one thing, she never made it home. The police investigated and turned up surveillance footage of her leaving the university, meaning whatever happened to her had to have happened on the two-mile walk back to her home. When they began digging into her private life, authorities found that she had a lot of secrets to hide, and they had a lot of leads to follow. When she wasn't busy being a chef, Claudia was busy cooking something else up, affairs. She liked to go to a local pub and flirt with married men. These one-time flings often turn into long-term relationships, but Claudia also had a bad habit of breaking up with her victims as soon as they abandoned their wives to be with her. As a result, a lot of the local population were not happy with Claudia at all. As recently as March of this year, nearly a full decade later, men are still being questioned as to her disappearance. This month, four men who were all in their 50s were arrested and interrogated. They were all released without charges. All in all, the case has cost nearly 800,000 British pounds and Claudia's body has never been found. Still, despite not having a body, one stark piece of evidence in particular is seemingly enough to convince authorities that this is officially a murder. Shortly before Claudia's final conversation with her mother, surveillance footage shows a man loitering around the general vicinity. Footage from the same camera allegedly shows the same man hanging around the same place the day before. What, if anything, was he waiting for? Worse still, there's additional footage showing a similar looking man heading down a path that leads to the back of Claudia's home. About a minute later, what appears to be the same man is seen heading away from the area, 
this time with what looks to be a work bag over his shoulder. He stops abruptly and freezes when someone sees him, which seems to be especially suspicious to the police. What exactly happened to Claudia as she walked towards her home, dressed in a white t-shirt, blue skinny jeans and white sneakers, her work clothes in a bag over her shoulder? Was an ex-lover watching her with rage from afar, silently brooding and now out for revenge? If so, what execution method did he use to snuff out her life in broad daylight on that fateful afternoon, and where did he put the body? Claudia's mother says she can sense her daughter is still alive, held captive somewhere and in misery. She doubts the police's theory of an ex-lover. Either way, the question remains, dead or alive, where is the body of Claudia Lawrence? Number 4. Quality Time and Suicide at first glance, this footage of a mother and son checking into hotel resorts looks innocent enough and maybe even happy. Here, Amy Fry Pitson and her son Timothy are on a three-day road trip filled with stops at zoos, water parks, and other fun activities for them to grow closer and bond together. She decided to take him out of school early and surprise him. Sounds good, right? Reviewing the security footage, which spans from Illinois to Wisconsin, you would never know that Amy has just kidnapped her child and was now on a final journey towards death. Reviewing the security footage, which spans from Illinois to Wisconsin, you would never know that Amy has just kidnapped her child and was now on a final journey towards death. Footage from a grocery store in Illinois captures Amy leaving shortly before her death. Her corpse would be found soon after in a hotel, deep slashes adorning both her wrists and neck. A suicide note near her bloody carcass explains that her son was with people who love him and keep him quote unquote safe. It also says quote unquote, you'll never find him. A message directly towards Timothy's father. Even though Amy's body was recovered, police remain unsure as to whether or not Timothy was kidnapped or killed, which makes the video footage even more haunting. If you look closely enough, you can even see Timothy show hotel staff what appears to be a toy completely oblivious as to what horror awaits him at the end of his vacation with his mom. Perhaps these were even his last happy moments to ever be recorded on tape. Even if he is still alive, Amy's death letter was right, you'll never find him, she coldly stated, and they never did. Number 3. Death at Londa's High How can a student mysteriously die on a crowded campus during school hours with absolutely no witnesses to testify as to what happened? That's what Georgia authorities had to determine after Kendrick Johnson's lifeless body was found in the high school gym. The circumstances of his death were beyond bizarre, something straight out of a murder mystery. His body was found head first rolled up in a rubber mat. When his corpse was removed, Kendrick's face was so swollen with blood that has stopped circulating long ago, he was completely unrecognizable. There was also blood in his hair, on the floor, and on the wall. Despite these suspicious conditions, an autopsy by the state of Georgia ruled that Johnson died of positional asphyxia, which is a fancy term used whenever someone gets themselves stuck in a position that they can't breathe in. According to investigators, Kendrick Johnson must have gotten stuck in the rolled up gym mat after diving inside to recover a shoe. This explanation, however, only seemed to raise more questions from the general public. How is there so much blood from a suffocation death? Students sometimes left their shoes on the gym mat if they did not have a locker available, but why would Kendrick remove his shoes before reaching for a single anonymous shoe, and why would he care about them to begin with? If he was really going to steal them, wouldn't he remove his shoes afterwards and not beforehand? Who, if anyone, was with him? No solid answers as to how this occurred have been provided by police or by the student population. But oddest of all, authorities chose to not take the sneaker found just yards away from Kendrick's body as potential evidence. The sneaker was even stained red, further adding to the mystery. Kendrick's parents knew that something was amiss so they hired an independent medical examiner to perform a second autopsy. The parents felt that their son had been murdered, and the official results had completely validated their heavy skepticism. The coroner found blunt force trauma on the right side of Kendrick's neck, close to the jawbone, and additional hemorrhages to the jawline that were not reported during the first autopsy. 
According to this independent examiner, there is no way Kendrick's death was an accident. This was clearly a murder. Yet, security footage of that fateful day shows nothing out of the ordinary. Kendrick Johnson walks calmly through the gym and does not seem to be under any amount of distress. A couple of other students shoot a basketball after he walks by them, and they soon walk off camera in his general direction. Kendrick's family filed a $100 million lawsuit against the school and the state investigators in response to what they feel was a botched investigation, but dropped the allegations at the beginning of this month. Although police have officially ruled the case closed, no one truly knows what happened to Kendrick Johnson, or they have simply not stepped forward to say. Number 2. The Execution of Brandon Woodard Brandon Woodard, 31, was texting on his phone while walking down a Manhattan street known for drug activity. The nightclub promoter from LA was a well-known playboy, ingratiating himself in the same social circles as professional athletes and movie stars whenever he possibly could. It didn't always work out like he wanted, however. His claim to fame was being beat up by the bodyguards of the R&B star Usher, a story Woodard liked to brag about whenever he got the chance. Today was not about Hollywood social circles or nightclubs, though. Today, Woodard had traveled across the country to Manhattan to collect drug money, and he was on business to collect debts from previous drug fronts. As he walks down the Manhattan street on his phone, a man waits for him to pass first, then comes up from behind holding a gun. Earlier, while living in California, Woodard was in charge of a large amount of cash. The money was being held for safekeeping on behalf of dealers all across the entire city of LA. But Woodard managed to get in trouble and the money was confiscated. Woodard had lost tens of thousands of dollars and angered a large number of LA dealers in the process, a bad combination that would later prove fatal. The gunman fires a single shot at the back of Woodard's head, ending his life on a public street during the early morning hours. The assassin hurries to the street corner and jumps inside of the getaway car, a Lincoln MKZ. That was in 2012. Police have since captured the getaway driver, a man named Lloyd McKenzie, along with five others who helped Woodard transport cocaine from California to New York. Lloyd McKenzie personally owed Woodard $160,000 in cocaine fronts, so erasing Woodard would also wipe the slate clean on his massive debt. He has recently been charged with second-degree murder, operating a major drug trafficking operation, conspiracy, and felony possession of a controlled substance. Although he may not owe $160,000 any longer, his life is still effectively over. As for the gunman, police were never able to locate him or uncover his true identity. His drug posse never gave him up, either out of respect or out of fear of risking their own lives. Either way, he literally got away with murder in broad daylight on a national case, something that is pretty embarrassing for Manhattan police. Try as they might to forget the one who got away, the killer's shadowy silhouette continues to mock them on tape to this day. Number 1. The Man with the Purple Bag He signed into an Irish hotel as Peter Bergman, and he seems remarkably out of place. For starters, he was very tall, and secondly, he was dressed way too professionally for the small Irish town of Sligo. Still, he kept entirely to himself, nodding hello politely to the hotel staff whenever they saw him, otherwise disturbing no one at all. Though he did not cause any problems outright, the man who called himself Peter Bergman had a dark problem of his own. He was eagerly ready to die. The hotel staff began to notice a strange habit from their quiet guest. Every day, Peter Bergman would leave his hotel with a small purple bag. The bag would be full at the beginning of his journey, but when he returned, it would be completely empty. Later, authorities would conclude that he was carefully getting rid of his personal belongings little by little, but at the time, no one knew what he was up to. The old man went to great lengths to make sure he was never caught on surveillance tape disposing of its contents, so no one knows what was in the bag for sure. On his second day visiting Sligo, the old man went to the post office and bought stamps. Again, no one knows who he was writing to, if anyone, but it can be presumed that he wrote at least one letter to someone out there in the world before doing what he did next. After drinking a cappuccino and eating a sandwich, the old man visited a nearby beach. 
Two locals noticed him looking extremely out of place as he hiked up his trouser legs and walked straight into the ocean, but the two did not give him much more thought as they left the beach. The next day, the old man's body was discovered by a father and son washed ashore. They solemnly prayed over his body and contacted the local authorities. They found absolutely no identification on the man's body. If anything, it seems the man had gone to great lengths to evade identification, even going so far as to cutting the tags out of his clothing so that they could not identify what country his clothing was from. An extensive database search showed that the name Peter Bergman was not linked to any passport issued in Europe, North America, or South America. His DNA and fingerprints likewise turned up no leads. He paid the hotel in cash, so there was no money trail to follow, but the mystery did not end there. An autopsy report shows that the man's body did not show any external evidence of drowning. What does this mean? Well, most drowning victims show visible signs of drowning on the outside of their body. For example, this could be foam at the mouth or nostrils, or a froth in the airways, or a hyperexpansion of the lungs. None of these were found in the deceased body, so they cannot say he drowned for sure. In addition, they found an abundance of cancerous tumors in the man's bones and prostate. These tumors must have been excruciatingly painful, yet the medical examiner found no trace of pain medication in the man's system. Not even a single aspirin. One thing was clear, the man was in extraordinary pain and was hoping to vanish out of sea without a trace. The most surprising testimony, however, comes not from the coroner, but rather from the hotel staff. The front desk checked in on him one day after a cleaning woman couldn't get the door opened. When they went to see if he was okay, she said he appeared extremely relieved that it was only the hotel staff, as if he was expecting it to be someone else. Was the man with no name trying to escape from more than just his pain?